So, you know, Dave mentioned in his presentation that in uh, NOAA Fisheries, the science for ecosystem management was really strong, and uh, Anne Hollowed, senior scientist at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, uh, is, is a big reason that for that. She's uh, one of those people that can talk fisheries management, she can talk oceanography, she can talk fish ecology, she can talk food up models, uh, so she's been a real pivotal player in uh, advancing ecosystem science for NOAA. So thanks, Anne, for presenting. Yeah, um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I've really enjoyed uh, being able to be part of this, and I really want to thank Tanya Bevan. I, the, the fact that we all gather once a year for this uh, annual Bevan Symposium is really a fun event, and as a former student and, and as watching what Don Bevan has done for all of us and is still doing for all of us, I, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, so <coughs> it's been fun looking at the effect of the Magnuson-Stevens Act and how it's progressed through time. Uh, I have the fun job of looking at, well, where do we go in the future? And in particular, how do we bring the Magnuson-Stevens Act's constructs into an ecosystem context? And much of what I'll talk about today is not only my research, it's, it's the collective research of the council as well as the Alaska Fishery Science Center. So. If there's a mistake, it's mine, but otherwise everybody else really contributed to what I'm going to say. Oh, uh, what do you do here to go forward? Key, keyboard. Oh, the keyboard. Oh, okay. Okay. Did that do it? Oh, sorry, I need my glasses. <laughs> That's one thing that has changed since the last time I gave a Bevan talk. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Yeah, this is it. So uh, you heard from Dave that that the, he was really uh, a pivotal player in coming forward with this uh, ecosystem-based fisheries management document. And a lot of the principles that the Alaska Fisheries Science Center is, is focused on, as well as the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, really happened because of that single document. I, I really give you credit for it, and thank you. But uh, we've talked about this 7,000-page <coughs> programmatic EIS. Well. All of us at the Alaska Fishery Science Center were part of those 7,000 pages, and all of our work is documented in this paper that Dave Witherall, who, who is here, and Chris, of course, you've heard, and Clarence Ponsky uh, were, were all part of. The, um, but what came out of that effort was uh, uh, really the product of the NEPA process, this programmatic EIS that you have to go through uh, whenever you're looking at a federal action every in our case, about every five to eight years. And in doing that, with this document as a background, we were able to really think about how we want to construct the goals and policies of the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council, uh, given that background of, an e of the ecosystem approach. And the great thing about it is you can see here these check marks that we have. A lot of the principles are really there up front and center. You can find our goal statement and. Uh, is there a pointer? Uh, to no. your left. Ah, got it. Um, let's see. Yeah. You can really see that here. But, but the great thing about it is that, that just like the Magnuson Act, uh, rule number one is we want to prevent overfishing. And that we're doing that through the annual catch limits that Rick talked about yesterday. The other piece of it, and that's why I reacted so much when Chris was talking yesterday, <laughs> is that we do have, uh, we promote sustainable fisheries and communities, of course, but we do have a construct of preserving the food web, and we do that, our primary tool to do that is through this weak stock management. So the idea is that we have a lot of multi-species catches. Uh, we have trawl fisheries in the North Pacific, but we look at the, and one thing that makes working in Alaska is so great, is the observer program. If any of you are involved in the observer program, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, but, but because of that, we can do in real time, in season management, and look at the bycatch of the resource as it comes forward, and the incidental take of target and non-target species. And we can stop the fishery or put a constraint on it and warn the fleet that they're getting close to the ABC so that they can take action to avoid additional catch of the weaker stocks. You've already heard from, from Joe Sullivan about the efforts that we're bringing in place to reduce bycatch. 
Our big players are prohibited species uh, catches in the North Pacific, that's salmon, halibut, herring, and crab, but we also are looking at non-target avoidance as well. The provisions for considering other animals outside of the FMP are certainly front and center in what we do. We have this endangered short-tailed albatross as well as the stellar sea lion, and so a lot of the actions that were taking place as we formed these goal statements had those two species in mind, and so we have taken actions, either gear in the case of seabirds or area in the case of, and seasonal allocation of the quota in terms of marine mammals. And of course, the EFH was part of what we were looking at, so habitat is there. So I would say we get a pretty good score. These other pieces here, not that they're not important, it's just they're sort of socioeconomic, and I'm, that's not really outside of my field. I certainly like data quality. Um, so, so where do we, you know, my good job up here is to try and think about where we go from here, and, and Beth Fulton from uh, Australia has just written a paper where she looked at the different, you know, so say you wanted to change how you prosecute a fishery, how would you do that? What are sort of the strategies that you could evaluate? And, and the interesting thing when I read the paper was that so many of the things that were out there as possible changes that we might make are already incorporated into the management of the Alaska, uh, the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. We have property rights. You've already heard about some of these. The Sablefish and Halibut ITQs, the American Fisheries Act dealt with Pollock, and now Amendment 80 has dealt with the non-Pollock trawl, non trawl catch. And so these have helped to rationalize our fisheries in the region, and it's done a great job in terms of the cooperative, not only in terms of in improving the economics of, and the profit from the fishery, but also the cooperation among fishers. It's reduced the competition in terms of racing for fish. <laughs> Community-based management is certainly a part of what we do. We knew head on that we needed to protect the smaller communities in Alaska. They were important constituents, and so there's a community development quotas that are set aside that was put in place in 1992. And certainly we use time, area, and quota management as much as, as much as we can. The incentive-based approaches are not very prevalent where we are, although you just heard from Joe that, that we are exploring that. The salmon bycatch was a, a really interesting experiment, and I think we'll do more of it as we move along. And so I think that's a real success story where you have an overall cap on the removals but you allow the industry to begin to think of creative ways of achieving that, of staying under that cap. And of course, spatial management is part of what we do. And I'm gonna show this plot and not, I, like <laughs> the previous speaker, I don't want you to read every little piece of this. The take home message is that even though the, uh, the resources off of Alaska and the areas that we manage are gigantic, uh, we also have a complex suite of time and area and gear restrictions in the area that, that overlay into essentially a, a, the, the landscape of where one can fish. And there are some uh, permanent closures like no trawling in southeast Alaska. These blue areas are uh, stellar sea lion protection zones. Uh, these are to maintain the critical habitat designations. And there are, are areas where no trawling is allowed to protect uh, uh, the habitat as well as to allow for crab fisheries to take place. This is a crab, uh, red king crab uh, protection zone. So it's those sorts of things. And so this is the landscape that we have evolved to in terms of fixing uh, gear interactions or area partitions. One thing to keep in mind is in response to the EFH, we froze the footprint in the Aleutians, so a lot of the areas offshore within our regulatory area and in the Northern Barrier Sea are now close to fishing until which time you can bring forward a proposal that, on how you will manage the impact of trawling or, or a new fishery in those areas. I mentioned this, and I'm not going to belabor it because uh, Joe already went through it, but, but we do have a variety of measures to protect the species that lie outside of the jurisdiction of the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council. So while we do have, an, uh, while we do, 
the crab fisheries are certainly a federally managed uh, resource. It's managed under a separate FMP than the ground fish, and so there are constraints there to make sure that uh, the ground fish fishery doesn't take too much crab. Uh, in addition, the Pacific Fish, uh, Halibut Commission has constraints on how much halibut we can take in our, our flatfish fisheries. And likewise, we, you've already heard about salmon and herring. And so we do play, pay a considerable amount of t attention to uh, make sure there's an open resource and availability for these other commercially important species. So where are we going to go from here? Um, when, that, uh, when the report was written on an ecosystem approach to management uh, in 1999, uh, that triggered a whole lot of papers, as Dave said, that came out of it. And one of them was really this, uh, a paper by Phil Levin at the Northwest Fishery Science Center that gets cited a lot because it really laid out how we would look at this integrated ecosystem assessment and what it would look like, how we'd put it together. At the time he wrote that paper, the principal pieces of it were these sort of five ideas that, that you would go through a, a scoping so you'd look at what, how the ecosystem is structured, identify the indicators that you think are really representative of the status of that particular ecosystem. You then conduct a risk analysis based on the, the, the indicators that you've drawn out of that you'd run a, a, an, an assessment of how fishing affects those given these risks that you've already identified, and then look at a variety of different management strategies, and not the management strategy that, that we think of, those of you who are students here think of management strategies as a full operational model and all of the things that Andre has you do. This is more just looking at how would, a, in a qualitative sense, how would that management strategy play out. And the Alaska Fishery Science Center has done a wonderful job of that. Every year we, put, we gather what's known as the uh, Ecosystem Considerations Chapter, which is an enormous document, about 300 pages, that updates the status and trends of different ecosystem indicators, that, uh, uh, whether, whether they're physical, biological, or trends in the, the fleet itself. Uh, those are all documented and ready for us to consider before we set the quotas. But where are we going? And this is really what I think is the transition phase that we're in. And if there's any message that I want to say at this meeting, it's really this is where we're going. Is that the effort now is no longer to just pull up indices of different ecosystem states or uh, states of the fishery or the uh, anthropogenic impacts on the, on the uh, ecosystem, the idea is to really begin to build the models that will functionally connect all of those different disparate pieces so that we can project those forwards in the aggregate so that we can begin to look at how the strategies that we're considering really would play out in terms of the overall landscape of ecosystem uh, status and uh, trends as well as the fishery removals that you can get out of it. So how are we going to do that? Well, uh, Dave said that this should be incremental, and we are incremental in this. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the first thing that we have done is to, this is sort of the typical decision-making framework that we have in Alaska where, where the stock is, it all begins with a collection of data from, from, from the field, so whether it's fishery dependent or fishery independent data or the associated sampling that we do when we're out there, those are all fed into an assessment and then goes through a detailed review process, a technical review by the plan team and then a, an additional review and quota setting by the SSC. What we're doing now is taking that ecosystem chapter that I mentioned on the previous slide and drawing those indicators out to actually look at them and consider them and they're reported on before we ever get into this process in terms of setting the quotas. But what we're doing now is transitioning to actually look at the functional response to, of the individual species to that indicator. So we can begin to couple in bioenergetic effects onto the growth of a particular animal. Look at the climate effects on the selectivity or catchability or availability of the uh, resource to our surveys or the fishery, either one. 
look at time varying changes in natural mortality rate and or maturity schedule, all of which have direct effects on the stock assessment. The great thing about doing that is that they're in the currency that everybody's familiar with with the council process. And so the review teams in the SSC uh, can easily adopt those changes right away. And that's a real advantage. It's not some foreign ecosystem model over here. <laughs> this is directly in the currency that we're doing. But of course, those are if in the lexicon of ecosystem modelers, sort of a minimally realistic modeling approach. And so where are we going to go from there? Well, we need to take into account the, the uh, sort of why would you build a full ecosystem model if you could get by with that sort of indicator incorporation into the stock assessment. And the reason is, is that there are some big changes that are likely to happen over the next 20 or 30 years in, in the North Pacific. And climate change, of course, if you know me, I think this is the issue of our time, and we need to be aware of it. The great thing about it is we have a little time to plan on what that landscape of a changing climate will look like in terms of the availability and abundance of resources that we can be uh, prosecuting in terms of fishing. And so that's a clear piece. The other side of that is that hasn't been mentioned that much, I only think one or two people mentioned it yesterday, is that the population gro is growing. And so we're going to see increased demand for markets for fish, particularly in China. We, we heard about that a little yesterday. But as well, we want to, we're going to have to think about what is the role of the United States in provisioning food or to human beings around the planet. And I, I, that's going to be an interesting conversation. There's also, as we see lots of sea ice in the summer, in the Arctic, there may be increased shipping through that area. You can imagine that going over the polar route may be an option in the future. And offshore energy development. And the other piece that I don't want us to lose sight of, and, and Dave's last slide really dealt with this, is, is the issue of where, what's going on internationally and, and where is all of that going? And the, there are three things that I think we need to pay attention to. One is FAO is revisiting their sustainable development goals, and I think those will may be a piece that we want to take a look at once those are done. The Convention on Biodiversity is doing a global assessment of the status and trends of ecosystems around the world, and it'll be nice to take a look at that. And of course, the, every seven years we'll see the product of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and I think we'll receive guidance from all of those. So I'm going to spend a couple minutes. Where at, who's my timekeeper? Just so I, okay. So you'll tell me when I'm ten minutes away. Okay, okay, perfect. Okay, so I mentioned climate change, and this is a paper that Scott Donnie and several of us worked on. But, but it's not a surprise. I mean, what you're seeing, what we saw, is sort of a. These are sort of global indices, but you fill in the big ones: sea level rise, summer sea ice extent in the Arctic. Um, overall heat content of the ocean, the sea surface temperature, or ocean acidification, all of these time trends are being detectable now, which is something that we really didn't have seven or eight years ago. You can see, really see some of the trends in some of these newer pieces, and, and they're all changing. And so we need to be prepared for this. Why are we so worried in the, um, in the North Pacific, and particularly the Bering Sea? is because in a zone that's affected by seasonal sea ice, like the Bering Sea, you can really, the, the effect of ocean conditions has a great role in ecosystem structuring and the development of ecoregions across the, the uh, Bering Sea shelf. This is an example that Al Herman uh, over at the, uh, who's part of Jassau and works a lot with the folks at uh, PMEL, um, what they looked at was this is what happens when there's seasonal sea ice is that there there is a remnant pool of cold cold water that forms in the bottom and persists all the way through the summer so this is a july snapshot from from an aggregate of all of the cold years all of the average years and all of the warm years and you can really see the signature of that cold pool when it's warm it really retreats back and you can imagine if you're a cold pool avoider this sort of this opens up an enormous amount of re 
uh, available habitat for you. So the great thing about the ecosystem modeling that's come out of the Bering Sea project that was a joint effort between NSF and the North Pacific Research Board is we can now put that currency into sort of the projections that come out of the global uh, climate modelers. And so these, are, these colors are three different climate models, the Canadian model, the Japanese, and the German model. And what Al has done is he's used those as forcing uh, boundary conditions on a regional ocean circulation model to give an idea of what the mean sea surface temperature is going to look like on the bottom in the future. And the take home message from this is twofold. One is that, that all of these models are showing an increase in temperature, but the other is that you're seeing enormous interannual variability across all of these. But the thing that really caught my eye when I looked at it, it was in at least two of the three models that he looked at, the probability of having a cold year in the Bering Sea you know, we may begin to see that sort of absence of cold years in the Bering Sea by as early as, say, 2025, which is within the time frame of our planning. So how would we do that? Uh, you know, climate change affects a lot. And, you know, it's going to affect the gl gl growth and bioenergetics of the species, the recruitment variability, the the selectivity and catchability, it's going to change the phenology of the species. It has all of these variety of things that it could affect. And in order to trace that all down, particularly re with recruitment, you'd want to know how climate variability and change is affecting all the life stages of your organism so you could track that through time. Well, asking National Marine Fisheries Service to do that on every species in the ecosystem is a tall order. The great thing is that Sarah Geitches, who was a former student here, uh, uh, looked at, came up with a way of identifying nodal species, and that is the species that really have a lot of the energy of the food web flows through it. And I, I think this is an interesting idea because perhaps what we could do is use our food web, perform the network analysis to identify the nodes, and then go from there. So how, what, what, what are we going to do with an ecosystem approach to management in the future? And I think the real key is what uh, Andre is pushing, this idea of doing a management strategy evaluation where you develop a full model, where you look at all of the pieces, you capture all of the sources of uncertainty by having an operating model with known characteristics as well as all of the errors associated with the sampling of that ecosystem. We've already started that. Uh, Teresa Amar has done a full uh, operating model and, and a climate forecast on Gulf Pollock. Uh, Franz Muter, Jimmy Anelli, and uh, um, Tom Wildeber have looked at a variety of species. Those were not full MSCs with an operating model, but they certainly had, were climate-enhanced stock projections. And Kirsten Holtzman uh, has now tried this with a multi-species model. The sort of strategies that you look at when you build a model like that are sort of outlined here where you can look at adjusting the buffer for uncertainty or you could look at a steeper harvest control rule like you saw with Steve. There are a variety of sort of what I call engineering approaches that you can look at and you could use, test those out. The other piece would be to look at a little more uh, fully at this. So, we're, we're looking at a multiple model projections of what climate will look like to see just how they all compare. So you can look at, at this would be your sort of climate en enhanced single species modeling approach. You could look at a climate enhanced multi-species approach, a full end-to-end -end model that's capturing the whole ecosystem, which is with upper trophic levels and fisheries embedded or a multi-species technical model that takes into account all the interactions of the uh, fisheries because of that bycatch limitation. So we have this suite of models that we're bringing forward. The, the enterprise that we're, we're really looking towards is to try and figure out how, what is the ultimate goal. And I think within National Meat Fisheries Service, our thought is really a partnership with the Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is right next door for us in terms of PMEL, uh, looking at how we can gather the data we need to run these types of models, then look at the 
uh, develop the type of multi-model ensembles that I just showed you. The key here is to get to the point where we are more like the weather service, where we have the ability to run these models periodically. With They've been ground truth. The public will have great trust in the forecast, and we'd run those probably in uh, tandem with the onset of the IPCCs. And so this is where we'd like to be. We're sort of in this mechanistic understanding model selection skill assessment part of this process. And so I'm going to skip this. My take home messages are here. The one piece of all of this is as we begin to build an ecosystem approach to management, we've got to, at the for, first and foremost, make sure we uh, maintain the monitoring that we need to do the stock assessments. In terms of looking at the process oriented work, I th I've given you an idea of how you might prioritize the species looking at that nodal network. The biological reference points are going to be difficult to estimate because they're all based on equilibrium thoughts, and we don't have those necessarily in a changing climate. So we're going to have to think about how do we develop uh, flexible management strategies that will, will deal with that type of trade-off. The one thing is about looking into the future is that I can get my head around thinking about how the environment is going to change and the climate's going to change. But I think we really need to engage the stakeholders, and we've heard that throughout this meeting, that they need to be part of this planning process so that as we project forward 20 or 30 years forward, that we also are correctly managing the future of, of fishers and, as well. And so I think that's my take home of the, where we are in Alaska in terms of an ecosystem approach to management.